everybody, I'm gonna be doing two videos here. This one's gonna explain people the common characteristics of a of an ordinary stalker, and then we're gonna compare what we found out from this um, in the next video, which will be, these videos will be connected now. The next video will also talk about um, organized stalking. There's gonna be several key points in here where he will mention when he mentions the whole thing about um, how stalkers basically manipulate the reality of things, the term for that is known as gaslighting. So yes, even organized stalkers, as you all know, they use the gaslighting method quite, quite often. As well as your ordinary stalkers would do the same. But there are many different characteristics that people who are still who are just now looking into this stuff they need to be aware of. They are very, there are some differences in between both um, organized stalking and just your ordinary stalking. But TIs, I want to warn you all, when they start uh, gaslighting you with the colors, the, 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 and this is what I was mentioning, just get a pair of video glasses. If you, po if you possibly can, that's the best thing you can do. Why? Because they can't hack into that. They can't screw with your evidence do, uh, on that. And you can also keep backing up many copies of it. Now then, um... The thing about this is that you don't want to be reacting to the colors that they do, you know, that they are, you know, flashing in front of you. Why? Because the gang stalkers could easily wear just about any color that gaslights you, right? But what's going to happen when another, you know, when some people who are just minding their business, who are not a part of it, walks by and that happens. And then, you, you know, you just assume that that's a gang stalker when in reality, you see, you see where that's getting at? So you got to be very careful with that because there could be, I mean, anybody could wear a, a, a red shirt, a blue shirt. Anybody could wear any of these shirts. But of course, these gang stalkers do it all the time. That's the point. They do that to gas you to, in order to get you to act out in a, in a way um, against somebody who's not a part of it. And the person, that person is not going to know what's really going on. And of course, these gang stalkers are just are, are, are actors, man. They're paid street theater actors that's just what it is they're going to report and they're going to do all of this stuff and the whole damn thing is illegal as hell it really is but you got to learn to uncondition yourself from that when they do all of these things to trigger you learn to uncondition yourself from that and the best thing to have is the video camera glasses because that's capturing everything that's happening now, here's a good tactic to basically use, right? Think about it. Okay, you catch them in the colors one day, right? Don't react to it. But you catch them again, but they're doing the verbal harassment. The verbal harassment. So you caught them doing two things. This is why I have the three strike method. If I catch them doing the same thing three times, that's it. Without a doubt, that's a perp. Without a doubt, that is a perp. Two times, that's more than enough. Because you're not just going to be in the colors and also do the verbal harassment. Well, first off, all I know, that person who they're talking to may be the gang stalker themselves who brought up the subject, right? Who brought up the, who stopped them right there. Brought up the subject, and for all I know, that person just so happens to commonly shop in that location or commonly go in that location, right? This is why I have the three strike method. Because of that, I make certain that I, I view all the ins and outs of the situation. This is very important because you don't want to get the wrong idea, you don't want to make assumptions, you want to be right on point with the situation. And uh, honestly, like when you see these gang stalkers on film, they're they're, they're pretty obvious. They're pr they're pretty obvious with their behavior. But um, I wanted to make this video for a lot for not just TIs, but for fellow people for people out there who may not be too far aware of the different characteristics of both organized stalking and um, the regular stalking. This is very important because this is how we're going to be able to identify this on the spot. Make, now, pay attention because this guy's going to bring up some very key points. Again, this video is only for educational purposes. Nothing more, nothing less. Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel.
Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks, what is borderline stalking? So I've seen this question a few times and kind of related questions. Another related question here would be, what is fatal attraction syndrome? Which, of course, isn't a real syndrome. It's just a term people use sometimes to really refer to the stalking behavior that we sometimes see with borderline personality disorder. The reason we see the term fatal attraction in there is because of a 1987 movie by the same name with Michael Douglas and Glenn Close. So this movie portrayed behavior that could be attributed to borderline personality disorder. And we've seen other movies that kind of follow the same pattern. So really what this question is getting at is what is the relationship between borderline personality disorder and stalking? And I think when we think of borderline personality disorder, people think of the frantic efforts to avoid abandonment and kind of connect that to stalking. So first I'll start with the definition of stalking. With stalking, we see an offender who exhibits chronic nuisance behaviors that result in deleterious emotional or physical effects on a victim. And it's believed to come from an illogical or rational fascination or preoccupation with an individual. And sometimes it can rise to the level of psychosis. So there can be reality testing problems involved with stalking. Now, sometimes in the research literature, we see another term used instead of stalking called unwanted pursuit behavior. And this is similar. There's a lot of overlap with stalking. But usually unwanted pursuit behavior is thought of as more widespread and less severe as compared to stalking. Also, stalking does not necessarily result from an intimacy motive, and it's always illegal. Unwanted pursuit behavior doesn't necessarily cause fear or threaten the victim, and it's not always illegal. One way we could think about unwanted pursuit behavior and its relationship to stalking could be unwanted pursuit behavior, again, like I said, isn't necessarily illegal, but if it occurs for too long a period of time, it could rise to the level of stalking. So one tactic, as they're called, with unwanted pursuit behavior may not be illegal, may not even be abnormal, but if it continues for a while, then we might have stalking. So, Which brings me back to one of my main points. They want you to basically make that assumption that the first person who just so happens to act out like that, oh, they're a perp. You need to be vigilant. Make sure that you have at least more than enough documentation evidence of the knowing the same characteristic behavior that is, you know, that is actually related to your targeting. That's your evidence. Why? Because they're doing all of that, which is, you know, and triggering to, and it proves the stalking of which is happening. If you take a look at Nappy Headed Roots' uh, channel, you see that uh, quite well. If you take a look at the channel known as um, Gang Stalking Simulation, you'll see the exact same thing. Many different people, many, many of the same people just so happens to show up with the same characteristics, doing the same things, the same gaslighting methods all the time. That's your evidence. But you got to learn to uncondition yourself from the tactics they use against you because they will use that to discredit you. You can't not let that happen. We see in the media that the stereotype of a stalker involves a stranger who stalks a celebrity. But what we see in reality is relational stalking, not stranger stalking, is the most prototypical form of stalking behavior. 80% of all stalking cases involve victims and perpetrators who had some type of prior relationship. And in half of all stalking scenarios, we see the individuals had a prior romantic relationship. Now, some of the descriptive statistics around stalking are really ranges rather than precise numbers because we see a lot of different studies on this topic and a lot of variation in terms of the results. For example, around 8 to 25% of women will be a victim of stalking at some point in their lives, and about 2 to 11% of men will be victims at some point in their lives. Now, with unwanted pursuit behavior, we see that 37% of ex-partners exhibit at least one of these tactics after a failed relationship. So unwanted pursuit behavior is remarkably common compared to stalking. Also, we see a number of benign tactics associated with unwanted pursuit behavior, like watching or monitoring 
or making exaggerated expressions of affection. With stalking, we see behaviors that are often considered more serious, as I indicated before. And if we look at the behaviors in terms of which ones are most common to which ones are least common, with stalking, we see unwanted telephone calls and messages are the most common. And then moving down the list, we see unwanted letters, someone who spreads rumors about an ex-partner. We see someone who is being followed or spied on. We see a victim being unexpectedly confronted by a perpetrator or being waited for. And then the least common would be to receive unwanted presence. So what does all this have to do with borderline personality disorder? I cover a lot of the aspects of stalking and unwanted pursuit behavior. Well, if we look at borderline personality disorder, we know it is a mental disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, specifically a cluster B personality disorder. So it's a personality disorder in the same group as antisocial, narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorders. With borderline personality disorder, we see nine symptom criteria. Somebody would have to have five criteria in order to be diagnosed. Everybody, you ever want, at fellow TRs, you ever want to know why they want us isolated so much? You ever wondered why they use the term antisocial so much? I'm not joking. They utilize a lot of crap to set you up. I'm not bullshitting. So when we act out, they are they're basically are stacking a bunch of crap against us, even though we're just basically, you know, just defending ourselves. But to the person who is not aware of the situation, they won't see it that way, unfortunately. But fortunate for us, a lot of people are waking up. ...with a disorder. So we see frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, an unstable relationship pattern, identity disturbance, so difficulty with self-image, impulsivity in at least two areas that would be self-damaging, suicidal behavior, affective instability, which is emotional dysregulation when somebody has difficulty kind of keeping their emotions in check. We see chronic feelings of emptiness, inappropriate or intense anger or difficulty controlling anger and we also see paranoid ideation or severe dissociation so as you can see some of those symptoms notice that paranoia I mean, how many times has a gang stalker tried calling you paranoid huh you ever wondered about that this is very important ti's because this is exactly what they're trying to construct and basically you know, try to reflect upon us, trying to say that basically we're the perpetrators, but in reality, it's the gang stalkers. Criteria seem to line up with the behaviors of stalking and unwanted pursuit behavior fairly well. The frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, the anger, the impulsivity, the emotional dysregulation, the unstable relationship pattern, and maybe even in some instances, the paranoid ideation and the chronic feelings of emptiness, because chronic feelings of emptiness might be related to rumination, and that's tied to stalking behavior. So one way to examine the relationship between borderline personality disorder and stalking would be to look at a group of people who have admitted to stalking or who have been convicted of stalking and seeing how many of those have borderline personality disorder. The difficulty with this is we don't have a lot of research in this area, although we do see some studies that cover this. And really this makes you wonder why, huh? Why they don't have a whole lot of studies in that is because there's it's, that that ain't just been that ain't just a coincidence. Can be broken down into two different groups. So with one of these groups, we see that for people who demonstrate stalking behavior that have not been charged with a crime. So these are people who admit to it, but again, there's no criminal justice involvement. We see that borderline personality disorder may be present up to 45 percent of the time. So in 45 percent of those people they may have the disorder. Now, for people in the criminal justice system, the prevalence drops somewhere between 4 and 15%. Congrats on your engagement. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, about who is this, by the way? Who cares if Ryan... No copyright. So fewer people in the... I claim no copyright for that. Don't think there's another one, though. But looks like there's probably going to be one at the end. Sorry about that, folks. Criminal justice system for stalking would have borderline personality disorder. Now this seems kind of unusual. There's no real quick or easy explanation for this. But one theory is that perhaps in those settings, in criminal settings, there are other explanations for a number of those stalking behaviors, including other mental disorders like schizophrenia.
So we don't really know. So this gives us yeah, another factor that TIs basically have to deal with when it comes to these gang stalkers. Yet yeah, another factor that gets brought into the equation. It's a range all the way from 4%, as I mentioned, up to 45%. Now, to make this a little bit more confusing, as we move away from examining criminal and non-criminal, we see other studies that show that with stalking behavior, about 50% of the individuals who demonstrate that behavior would have a cluster B personality disorder. Now, that may be borderline personality disorder, but it may not be, because again, there are three other personality disorders in cluster B. But we do know from this research that even in instances where there was another personality disorder other than borderline personality disorder present, the borderline personality traits are often at a high level. So what this means is that everything's... Hold on. So what, um, one thing to know about the persona personality disorder thing, you never know, you ever notice how like the, um, what's it, the gang stalker's behavior changes, right? It changes whenever you actually start to confront them about like what's going on. Oh, they'll act as if like they're completely oblivious to what they've done or from what they were doing. You ever notice that? You ever notice they'll actually just um, act as if like they don't absolutely have no idea. Again, these people were trained to act like this, people. They were trained to act like that. It's a big difference. We want to continue them. So there are nine symptom criteria for borderline personality disorder, but somebody could meet a few of those criteria and not have the disorder, but they may still have borderline personality traits or characteristics. So this kind of gives us a measure on a continuum as opposed to categorical, and it can give us more insight into stalking behavior and what may be connected to it. So borderline personality as a construct does seem to have a fairly strong relationship to stalking. Now, some people really struggle with the idea that individuals with borderline personality disorder might be more likely to engage in stalking behavior. And I think one of these reasons is because a lot of people think of stalkers as being primarily men. Now, we do know in about 75% of the cases of stalking, the scenario breaks down where the man is the perpetrator and there's a woman who's a victim. If you're wondering, I'm playing Super Mario Brothers as I'm making this video. So if I, if I react funny, I'll, you got my apologies on that. So this explains, again, the majority of cases, but that leaves a lot of other room for other types of scenarios, including scenarios where the female could be the stalker. Now, when we look to specifically unwanted pursuit behavior, which, again, is related, but it's not the same thing as stalking, we see that research indicates that men and women perpetrate an equal number of tactics over a similar time span. Now, the methods are a little bit different. So men stalk in a different way as opposed to women. We see men are more likely to leave unwanted gifts and messages of affection, and women are more likely to be physically violent toward their ex-partner. So the number of tactics are the same, but again, the expression is a little different. The type of tactics are a little bit different. Another way to look at the relationship between borderline and stalking would be to look at the risk factors and see if any of them seem to be tied to borderline personality disorder. Well, there are a number of risk factors for stalking and for unwanted pursuit behavior, including the initiation of a breakup by the perpetrator's ex-partner. We see more anxious attachment in the former relationship. So when a relationship seems to be kind of at the beginning of stalking, when it came from a failed relationship, we see that anxious attachment. And that's interesting if we think about borderline personality disorder because it does have an association with anxious attachment. We believe what happens here is the rejection elicits more obsessive thoughts about the ex-partner. And again, that's fairly consistent with borderline personality disorder with a few of the aspects, but that would include, as I mentioned before, the chronic feeling of emptiness. We also see that ex-intimate stalkers often have a history of criminal convictions and mental health problems, including higher levels of borderline personality traits, as I mentioned before. Some factors, though, when we talk about different personality factors and things like that, some of these factors have no explanatory value at all, meaning they don't appear to have any relationship with stalking. For example, avoidant attachment has no association with stalking. Empathy in the past relationship has no association, so a lot of people would think that low empathy would result in more stalking, but it doesn't. And we also see that psychopathic and narcissistic traits have no association to stalking, which I think is fairly surprising we think about all the characteristics of psychopathy 
and narcissism. So what are the typical characteristics of a female stalker? So when there's a female stalker, whether she has borderline personality disorder or borderline personality traits or something else or nothing else, what characteristics might we expect to see? What would be typical? Well, we see a study here of 82 women who were involved in stalking, and we get kind of a profile from this study. It's pretty interesting. I'll put all the references for the studies I used in the description for the video. So here we see the typical characteristics would be Caucasian, heterosexual, having an age range between 18 and 58 with an average of 35, not having children, and being well-educated. With this particular group of 82 women I'm talking about, about half had borderline personality disorder, and a third used substances while stalking. So there may be some comorbidity there with substance use disorder. The women in the study gave several reasons as to why they engaged in stalking behavior, which I think gives us some insight into what's going on in terms of mental health and personality characteristics. And the reasons were anger, obsessions, feelings of abandonment, dependency, and loneliness. So several of those, of course, could be tied to borderline personality features. The usual... For people who are wondering, it has been known that uh, some TIs, felt, uh, former relationship partners, have actually done this, you know, were responsible for putting them on this, you know, on this targeting program. This has been a known thing that has happened before. Stalking behaviors manifested by this particular group, again, female stalkers in this study, included telephone calls, messages, giving letters and gifts, driving by the victim's home or work, trespassing, following a victim. And we also see that more than half of the women threatened their victims, a quarter were physically violent with their victims, and three of the stalkers committed murder. They killed their victims. So when we talk about stalking, whether we're talking about a male or female perpetrator, we're really talking about something quite serious. I know whenever I talk about borderline personality disorder or cluster B personality disorders and stalking and these related constructs, there are going to be a variety of opinions, people who agree or disagree with me. Please put your thoughts in the comments section. As always, I hope you found this description of borderline personality disorder and stalking to be interesting. Okay, I had to stop right there because, as you know, there's an ad that pops up after this. So these are the characteristics of, um, you know, the different levels of, you know, the actual stalking that most of you are familiar with. The next video is going to go into organized stalking in a more profound way of, you know, of its demeanor and description.